or can hear me. If not, type a message. I'm sure my role will see it. We'll be good. Um, as Joe said, I'm Kirsten Murray. I work in the special education division and the Minnesota Department of Education. I crunch the numbers for them, and with a lot of numbers comes a lot. So I spend a lot of time thinking about how I'm going to make this look good. Um, and you can see all of our lovely pictures here. I am in a ball pit. Conference last week. Oh, you get a chance. It's <laughs> candy land for grown ups. <laughs> Okay, and now it's not working. Can you advance me, Mark? Yep. There we go. Um, so this is a joint cooperative thing between Wild Research, the Twin Cities Research Group, and the Minnesota Evaluation Association. Everyone, thank you. And I'm going to talk about some best practices in data visualization, specifically how do you go from default Excel, Excel settings to Looks best practice. Um, if you're uh, under 37 years old, Excel and you, <laughs> um, they've been really good about bringing new visualized data to Excel, but they haven't changed the default set. Also, the defaults, and they haven't really changed much in those 37 years. So let's look at what might happen. Oh, sorry, yes. Uh, at MPE, we have 10 commitments to equity. One of them is measure what matters, and what I like to say is if you're going to measure what matters, you better present that data in a way so that you can highlight what matters. Um, there is a common misconception in data visualization. Graphic pretty? No. What we're kind of trying to do is align the graphic presentation with how humans process information. We know a lot about how adults and especially white college softwares process information. Let's capitalize on that and make it so that we that information more accurately. Next one, please. Uh, so yeah, human information processing. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about audience a little bit later. Um, so you want to keep that in mind, who your audience is. This lovely graph here was presented in my building in March of this year. It was made by an MBE staffer. I'm not going to help them. But uh, it was in a room about five times this size, and it was packed. I'm sure the person presenting could hear me smack my forehead because of how ever, ever have been a pie chart. So what we're going to do is we're going to change this up and make it look so much better. Next slide. First of all, we're going to turn it into a horizontal bar chart. That's horizontal bar charts are great, especially when the categories on the vertical axis and you're not going to break any logical connection between those categories. Next step, we're going to resort the bar. Huge improvement now. You would have to fight with that pie chart to figure out who the top three categories are, but if I ask you now, you can point. Next step, we're going to widen the bars. Make it a little bit easier to compare from bar to bar. Next step, we're going to add data labels to all the bars. I'm going to tell you how many percent that is instead of you having to guess. Here you can see, assuming you can read the tiny screen. It's really tightly packed. And then the next step, To delete the horizontal axis and grid line. Now that we've done the both bars, we don't need the horizontal axis anymore. We don't need those grid lines that tell you 10% is this line right here. They're gone. And then next, we're going to start adjusting font size. Now it's about making it pretty, but also readable. You can read that left axis now. You can read those data labels. It's not. Next, we're going to adjust the font color. I don't know if you've noticed before, but when uh, Excel produces graphs, almost everything is really gray. You can really tell on a line graph, but um, making the black a long way to increasing readability, especially with your low vision, really helpful that way. Uh, we're going to remove the border, gray border around the graphic. Uh, 
Uh, Myra and I did a similar presentation on Monday, and somebody asked me, well, why your eye catches something? Process information that you don't put to that border. And now we're going to add a title and a subtitle. In the original graphic, it was as, as I presented. And the title was up on the bar. Well, if somebody takes that graphic out and shares it, now it's separated from the title. We have no context for understanding even what year of data that was collected from. So let's make sure same space, and we'll add a subtitle for a little bit more context. So now you know this fiscal year 2019, so that would be 1819 school year kids who have IEPs in the state, public and non-public schools. Last thing we're going to do is make any brand adjustments. Many of you know Minnesota went through a rebranding process and we all have the same logo and the same colors and it's, it's very pretty. This is now what I refer to as Minnesota Blue. And so that's done. And I think, yes, comparison slide. Now you can see how much easier it is to read the best practices for versus the original. I mean, even if the original had been a horizontal bar chart, the transition from all gray and hardly readable to black and an appropriate font size makes all the difference in the world. Resources. These are kind of my go-to. Um, anyone who's had a conversation with me? I live and breathe with Stephanie Evergreen kool <laughs> She's fabulous. If you're interested, and by the way, that this book comes with a little graphics that are presented in here. So you can follow along step by step and do exactly what her graphics do the steps that she's telling you and make your graphics on Excel exactly the way they look in this book two more helpful resources that she provided to all the readers. If you're interested in a more, I don't want to say esoteric, higher level thought processes around graphic and uh, visual design, love this book. It's Livewell Holden and Butler's Universal Principles of Design. Each two-page spread is a design concept. You on the left to get some information, and on the right to get it in action. So things like Superiority of that. There's small principles. That's what's in this book. And it was really um, written for software designers, but it also applies to data visualization. So I don't need these both up here and you can just look at them. Make sure I did. Any questions? You talk really so, yeah. But now that you are all armed with the new information, <laughs> um, and so I purposely say the word. Effectively, uh, but some are. Example for you today I have this table that a colleague shared with me earlier this year. This was um, data that was in an article with one of the clients that we work with. They, uh, they story about some of the information um, in this table. Fresh, um, doesn't immediately jump off the page um, what the story is. But I'll, uh, you know the frequency of you. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you. Do you want the clicker? 
Does it work? Oh. <laughs> you just have to push the down button. Not intuitive, but. On current use of rat research, we're comparing um, data collected from the Minnesota Dog 2014 to 2018. Within current use of rat users, we break it down by frequency and looking at the difference um, between 2014 and 2018. Frequency of these cigarettes among those who use them. So the percent of daily users increased among some of these groups from 2014 to 2018. But again, that story doesn't exactly jump off the page. So my colleague wanted help in figuring out how to tell the story. Um, so before I get into that, I wanted to take a, take a pause and share a few things related to best practices in table design. Um, this is how the table came to me, which I think overall actually looks quite good. Um, one thing that's a real problem about this table is kind of the, the lack of borders. There's really minimal use of borders, and borders that exist are kind of a medium shade of gray. Um, often, I think often the default for tables is to have a you know a black border around every single cell, so it's really overkill. Um, if you do spacing right, the spacing speaks for itself, and you don't need the extra border to say this is one cell, this is one cell. So good use of borders. Um, I also like that all of the numbers are right aligned. And all of the headings for the columns are right aligned as well. So I think a common mistake is uh, not matching the alignment of the column heading to the cells below it. So if um, a column of cells is right aligned, the heading should be right aligned as well. Because people often left align it or, or uh, center align it, uh, but really it should match the alignment of the cells below. Uh, one thing that has kind of already been given away with the advancement of the slide is that not all of these numbers are rounded to the same decimal place. So I notice there's just a handful of round It's important that uh, you always use the same number. Slide. Uh, maybe that's something that we can think about. It kind of will whittled this large amount. Once for the rows um, to draw your reader's attention to what it is. Out of the table. Um, it's usually not my first choice still, um, um, but you can, you can do it versus just leaving it totally. Okay, so my, my colleague came to me and she mocked up a bar. This is a just one of the things that we can do to make it look like a bar. Um, and then we can look at the variables comparing 2014 to 2018. So, okay, look at this. for intermediate use of users. that the bar chart was the most effective way to go. So I changed it to a school graph. I immediately thought about to focus on the that school graph is really, really effective in showing that directionality of how
The similar concept would apply if you have the like, response option in the middle, maybe that's gray. And then on the other two ends of the scale, you know, the color is increasing with intensity um, as you get to the outer parts of the scale. Does that make sense? Um, so again, these options are just kind of the same thing. Um, so again, it's not like it's a The other change uh, type that they made is that I rounded all the numbers to whole numbers. Um, in this case, uh, that exact precision of having one decimal place um, wasn't important, I think. Uh, losing it doesn't lose any meaning. In this case, around couple numbers, that might not always be the case depending on the data you have. Um, some data that we uh, often present in our work are um, quit rates for tobacco cessation programs. And that level of precision enough that um, one decimal place is really important. And so we do always uh, report our quit rates with one decimal place, but often I round couple number. Um, again, think about your audience, the level of precision that you need. Um, but I think always try to set up that thing is um, okay, so which of these uh, slope graphs, I essentially made um, six small multiples of the same chart, um, each one representing six variables that had a significant change from 2014 to 2018. I mentioned this in a journal article, and so right is what that so this change to the grayscale is very easy. Um, So if I were to um, transfer this to a report, say I was reporting this to a client, um, in the body of the report is where I might include um, the six small multiples, the charts, and kind of saying in a nice big heading what the key takeaway is. And then I would maybe read uh, the, the table in an appendix. It's probably not to be read, but if there's the um, three from my clear thoughts. If I were to present this to a client and break it down probably a little bit, When presenting information, I often like to stick to one idea per slide. Otherwise, here we're only looking at one of those parts. Matching the color. Choosing an effective display and saying more than one slide might work with the same type of information. So I just wanted to show you another example of displaying this information but with a totally different chart. So here. what display to use. It's just so important, again, to think about, um, as Kirsten said, think about your audience, think about what information is needed, and what, what information uh, you have that you need to share with your audience. Okay, so, hello. I'm very sorry. Um, 
down here give your necks a break from that side look down here also the microphone is here so I can just talk so again my name is Myra I'm going to talk about how do you visualize qualitative data um, my background and training is in qualitative research methods so that's where my passions lie one of my biggest pet peeves though is you have all this qualitative data and then people are like what do I do with it? And then the first thing that they want to do is they want to quantify it. They want to count how many people said those things. They want to write down, you know, give numbers to the words. And I didn't, you're not supposed to do that. Um, but, oh, have you seen that? It's not playing. It's supposed to be a GIF. You know, the lady, she's like, no. And then she's like, well, well, maybe. So that's kind of how I feel about qualitative data. You don't want to quantify and say seven people said this, but you as the analyzer can quantify it and not put numbers behind the words. What does that mean? How many of you have tables and tables of rows of Excel or, you know, words in an Excel sheet? Yeah. I have so many and I end up printing it out and color code it and then draw maps and it's a disaster. So this is what my desk looks like. There's a bunch of tables and colors. Um, this is, again, a draft of a logic model. You don't need to know what the content in it is just to know who's gonna read all this. It's not visually appealing. <laughs> you don't have any context for what this means, but it means something. So how do we get people to read this instead of just being like, oh, what do I, what, what is all this about? Um, so this is kind of my process for qualitative data. You want to theme what you read, color code it, make comments in Word. Um, one big tip is to not do this process alone. Having at least one other person doing this with you um, opens the doors of many other themes that come up that you might not even notice when you're going through all the data. And use the tools that you have, right? You don't need expensive stuff like in vivo. You don't need to even have Microsoft Word. You could just do this in Notepad, you know, highlight the things, cop copy, paste into a separate Word document, those quotes that really stand out to you. Um, use the markers, the highlighters, um, post-it notes. Use the things that are at your disposal. And then also show and tell. Show people what you are doing, because while all those pictures of graphs and Excel sheets may not mean something to another person, right? Just showing them all the data that you have, they're like, oh, I don't want to do that. You keep doing what you want or what you're supposed to. So what I did was I 
quantified all those different activities and put it in Visio. So I was able to say, you know, 10 items for the green bar and the three things in the middle are the main themes that came out of the research that I did. So while the state are working really hard at doing continuous program improvement and delivering technical assistance about how to build stronger partnerships and collaboration, we're not doing a whole lot over in how we deliver high quality programs, right? So we should, is our focus then, should we be doing more in that area? It doesn't mean it has to be a full 100% circle, but it shows my team where their energy, where their focus has been. We train grantees and they're doing a lot about building partnerships and collaboration, not so much in offering high quality programming or in evaluation. Our expectations is that that should be a full circle. And so that shows where a gap in our grant is what's happening. And then we're also seeing different levels, right? Our center, our programs, our students, they're living in the programs, right? They don't care about who's partnering with who or how you evaluate the programs. So that's something that we're trying to shift their mindset about too as we're moving forward with delivering technical assistance on our evaluation is how do we get these, not a complete circle, but how do they get more into the other things? And so that was the impetus for creating a new logic model theory of change. How many of you have seen complex theory of changes or logic models? Do you read them? Do you understand them? There's so much work. It's so much work to do this. And while, you know, academics and researchers, federal governments want something like this, we're changing, we're, I'm trying to make it more innovative. And so what we did instead was we made it an animated theory of change. So we talk about our values, who's at the center, it's the whole child framework. Right? You don't, again, these are things that you don't need to know, but as we're giving presentations and talking to our grantees, we're talking to all of these different stakeholders who are affected by our funding and telling them, how it all feeds back up to us, right? These are the things that they're supposed to operate under, that they are not siloed, that they all come together at some point. That's why we focus so heavily on all three of these sections. It all comes together. And so rather than having the tedious logic model, the formal traditional one, we have something visual that they can easily understand and take away, okay, I know the three program strategies, I know what level I'm supposed to be operating in and who it's for. One last thing I wanna end on is journey mapping. This is another visual thing you can do with qualitative data. Um, what this is, is it's a data collection tool really. It's a really intensive reflective exercise for your team um, and in the end you get this amazing visual product. What's a great about a journey map is that it helps your stakeholders and your audience build empathy. They understand the complexity of your programs. You get to see a bigger picture, and then you also get to see what strengths and pain points are. What is a journey map? So this is an example that I pulled um, online and I saw at AEA last week. This is the process of someone buying shoes. You have awareness, you see an ad, you see someone with a cute pair of shoes, you're like, oh, I want those. So then you go and do research. You're, what is it? Consideration. So you consider what price point, what brand, what store you want to buy from. Acquisition, you order it. How, or you go to the store and you buy it. You're trying it on. How is your service, the customer service are you getting? Was the shipping on time? Was it free shipping? And then loyalty, right? Do you go back and buy another pair of shoes from them? Do you go back to that store to buy a different pair of shoes? And so this is an example of how that process, while we all know how to buy shoes, to put it in a story and in a visual, like a journey map is a way to go. 
This is another example um, from the Smithsonian Office of Visitor Services. It tells the journey of someone visiting the museum. The highs are when they're really happy or when they're really excited. The lows are when they're overwhelmed or feel anxious, not so happy. And then you can kind of see, you can put in, instead of these little boxes, you can put quotes of what people said during the process, during the research. And so this kind of gives you a really template version of what questions to ask. Mm -hmm. We have 10 minutes. Do you minutes. want to try this? You can try. So what we did, do you guys have any questions before we do this? We were all given a same data set, and then we were all asked to kind of pull out what we thought was important. It was a question from the Minnesota Student Survey. If you go to the next slide, uh, the question is on the right, what is the main thing you plan to do right after high school? And those are the response options that people had. Um, Minnesota Student Survey is deployed every three years to students in fifth, eighth, ninth, and 11th grades, although only students in eighth, ninth, and 11th grades see the question on the right. Um, and so what we did was we scraped some of that data off of the website, we disaggregated it by grade and gender, shared it, and then we all took our own unique lens to the data and came up with visualizations. And I, Myra put me first, so I'm going to keep talking. Um, so uh, on the left, uh, if you have a second conversation with me that lasts more than five minutes, um, you will hear me say the phrase small multiples, and she beat me to it. Uh, but I love small multiples. So what you've got here is a panel of 8th graders, 9th graders, and 11th graders left to right. And it shows the proportions of girls, which is the purple line, and boys, which is the green line, who say they intend to attend a four-year college or university. Two things popped out at me. Girls are reporting a higher intent. And that intent is decreasing over time as the students get older, from 8th to 11th grade. And then one of the response options was also two-year college, that one, it's flipped. <laughs> Boys report higher intent than girls do, and that intent increases over time. So that's what struck me. I'm charts. Um, I saw hers before I mocked up mine, and so just for the sake of example, Um, I also had a hard time with this um, because I um, was by too many options, um, and I just I had so many questions more about the data. Why we're looking at this and what we want to achieve. Um, so I kind of in my head pretended that overall we were seeing that uh, the percent of students over time who intended to attend a four-year college after high school was decreasing and we wanted to dig in, you know, as a work group or with some stakeholders about why that was and maybe what are some differences between different demographic groups, groups one of which we looked at um, being males and females. So as Kirsten said, seeing that the percent of females who intend to attend a four-year college after high school um, is higher than males. Um, for both, it's decreasing over time, especially for males. Um, so I just stuck with 2013 and 2019, um, more so that I can utilize a slope chart and sh to show you how that would work um, in this scenario. Um, and then I also wanted to say, oopsies, wrong way. Um, I totally made up a goal for this. Um, don't quote me on this. This is totally made up. Um, but say there was a goal for the percent of students who intend to attend. Maybe there's a national average. In the data that you're working with, if you ever have something like that, that you can incorporate it into your chart, it's really helpful for interpretation. In this case, if there was a 70% goal, you know, we see that females are above that and males are below Maybe what can we do to try to increase the proportion of males? Um, and then maybe we do a similar thing by, by race in various demographic groups. Um, but again, I think this goes back to who's your audience, what's your purpose, 
what is it that you're trying to um, convey, uncover? What question are you trying to answer? Um, yeah, that's my rendition. And because they both focused on attending two or four year college university, I went the other way. Um, so while the majority of our students plan to go to college or university right after high school, they focus on 11th graders. What other things do they want to do other than that? So our males, 8.2% said they wanted to work. They plan to work. 6% join the military. 5% maybe something else. And so, and while the females scored higher for attending college or university, males in general for these other things scored higher. So, again, we're given the same data set. There's a bunch of different options in there. I was also overwhelmed with how much data we were given. It was just tiny though, tiny little Excel sheet, but there's so much to pull from it. So, yeah. Yeah, we have like five minutes, yeah.